Hello friends, I'm the Reverend Terry Peterson, Minister of St. John's in Gurik. Today is Thursday, the 1st of December, and it is 5 o'clock, so it's time for Wine and the Word, although in today's case it's hot chocolate and the word. <laughs> I don't have a fun um, alliterative thing for that, but I'm happy to hear your ideas for how hot chocolate and scripture might fit together, sort of the way gin and Jesus or theology do. Um, or wine in the word, obviously, but winter is here, so I can expect, I think, quite a bit of hot chocolate drinking on these videos in days to come. So today is the day when if you have an advent calendar like this, then it's the day to open the first door. So um, someone from Bible study has just brought me this Percy Pig calendar, or not just one person, two people have brought me this because they know how much I love Percy Pigs. And um, this looks like it has chocolate Percy's, so not like chocolate covered ones, I don't think. I think it will just be chocolates. I'm gonna open it and find out. Um, I'm looking for door number one, yes. Oh, it's got like a foil cover. I don't know how to open it. So you open your first day, in theory anyway, and then you get your treat. So the person who gave me this has one that someone gave them that has rubber duckies. Oh my goodness, this is so cute, look. <laughs> it's got a little chocolate Percy. Perfect. Now, you may have realized that today, a Thursday, is not the first day of Advent. It's the first day of December, and in sort of the secular world, those two things are put together as if Advent is just December and it's just counting down the days to Christmas so you open one door for each day. But of course, Advent is actually a liturgical season. Now, the <laughs> there goes the cat. The word liturgy means the work of the people. It's something that we do together to make space for recognizing God and for encountering the living God so that we can be more faithful and bring more glimpses of the kingdom into the world. So when we say something is a liturgical season, that means it's a season when we work together on a particular thing. So in this liturgical season of Advent, then we are working together toward the coming, toward encountering the coming God, the word that is coming among us. That's what Advent means. And Advent, as a season, began on Sunday, um, with the first Sunday in Advent, and it continues right up until Christmas Eve. And when we have that last Christmas Eve service and we sort of flip over to singing Yea, Lord, we greet thee, born this happy morning. That's when the season of Christmas begins. So the liturgical season of Christmas, the celebration of Christ's birth among us, the word becoming flesh, um, that runs from the 25th of December through the 5th of January. That's where we get the 12 days of Christmas song and the plays like Twelfth Night. Um, the Twelfth Night is the night of the 5th of January. And then that leads us to Epiphany on the 6th of January, which celebrates the coming of the wise men and the revealing of Christ as God's son to the world. And then we have that whole season of Epiphany where we think about the different ways that Christ is revealed. But in Advent, we are liturgically speaking, community speaking, the work of the people speaking, we are looking for the coming of Christ. Not only the coming of Christ as a baby, but also the coming of Christ into the world today. And how we do that obviously varies by person and by community, but one of the ways we do that is through our worship. We do that through our giving in this season. Maybe even we do it through calendars like this one where we get a little treat, but um, the main thing that we are doing in the season of Advent is not just counting down the days. We're not just waiting for the moment to arrive with no 
sort of preparation on our part, but we also are not preparing for something we can control. And I think that's a bit of a difference between how we prepare for Christmas in the sense of like Christmas starts in December and we just have parties and we go shopping and we decorate and we buy presents and we wrap presents and we put up a tree and all of that. Um, all of that is fine and good and it builds up community and it lifts our spirits at a dark time of year in this part of the world and that's all good. Um, what I think we're missing at that point is that Christmas is in some ways the ultimate symbol of how we are not in control of what God is doing in the world. So I can control my Christmas tree and my Christmas lights and I can control the foods that I choose to eat or to serve to others during the season. I can control the gifts that I buy and my response to the gifts that I receive. But what I cannot control is what happens when God's word takes on flesh and lives among us. That just literally changes everything and it, it makes such a difference to the world, the way it is, the way the world is, that it's well out of our control. Now, Everything is technically out of our control, however much we like to think otherwise. But the incarnation, God becoming flesh, puts God well out of our control also. And we like to think that we are controlling God with our prayers or our offerings or our good deeds or whatever. But the reality is that God is God and we are not. And God chose to come among us as a person and God chooses to use people to bring about the work that God has in mind in the world. And God chooses how and when the kingdom will be revealed among us. And that's what we're looking for in Advent. That's what we are preparing for. That's what we are waiting for, is this coming that changes everything and turns us all upside down so that we are not actually the ones in control of this anymore. Now, how do you prepare for something that you are not in control of? Um, that's a great question. And I think that to answer that question today, we will turn to the Gospel according to Luke chapter 1. So, in the beginning of the story of Luke's Gospel, after all the genealogy is finished, we read about Zechariah, who is an elderly priest, and his wife Elizabeth, who is also elderly, and how they don't have any children. And the angel Gabriel appears to Zechariah and says they will have a child, and um, Zechariah is not so sure about that, and he wants to know exactly how he will know, like how he can control that whole situation. And he ends up instead being struck mute until the baby is born which is a fun way of losing control of your situation. And Elizabeth then, of course, becomes pregnant. And then we have the angel Gabriel going on about six months later to see Mary, who is at the other end of her life. She's young and not yet married. Um, and so no one would expect her to be pregnant either. And Gabriel turns up and says, by the way, I know you're planning a wedding and everything, but... Um, also, you're going to have God's baby. And Mary does not try to figure out how she can control that situation. She wants to know how it's possible. Like, how is that sort of biologically possible? And Gabriel does his best to explain in a way that a first century girl might think was okay. And then she consents to this. And immediately it says that she goes to visit her cousin, Elizabeth, who was six months pregnant. So we're going to hear that bit of the story. This is from Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 39. Mary got up and hurried to a city in the Judean highlands. She entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. With a loud voice, she blurted out, God has blessed you above all women, and he has blessed the child you carry. 
Why do I have this honor that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. Happy is she who believed that the Lord would fulfill the promises he made to her. Now, this, I think, is one of the ways that we can prepare for something that is out of our control. So Elizabeth is experiencing something out of her control. She is pregnant well past the time when that would normally be possible. Mary is experiencing something out of her control. She is also pregnant, but well before the time that that should have been possible or allowed. And the two of them come together and meet one another and they spend three months together it says mary stays three months so just until it's time for john to be born and i think part of the reason mary goes to see elizabeth is because she needs that wisdom from another woman who is having a similar experience now what might we learn from that for our advent journey? How do we prepare for something to be out of our control? How do we wait for something that's out of our control? Well, perhaps the same way that Mary and Elizabeth do. They find one another and they talk about what they are experiencing. They share the joy and I'm sure they also shared the fear and the pain and the disruption and the confusion and the excitement and the anticipation but they both know that when those babies are born, they are out of their control. They might be able to imagine that they have some control when the baby's still in the womb, but once that baby's born, he is out of his mother's control. No matter what she thinks that she is doing to bring him up, these sort of divinely inspired babies are going to be probably something of a handful uh, that's played out farther into the story. John grows up to be a handful. Jesus was a handful when he was young, apparently. And then it says when he was 12 that he sort of settled down and was obedient to his parents. But you can imagine what those first 12 years might have been like based on what his last few years were like. All of that was going to be out of these women's control, but still they waited and they prepared and part of the way that I think they did that was by being in community with each other. Zechariah was mute, he's no help. And Joseph obviously can't really be in this picture because, well, all the social reasons why that's not so possible. And so these two women are building one another up. They're helping each other through this incredible experience. And they're trying to offer each one the wisdom that they have into the other one's situation. And perhaps in the process of that, they also discover the wisdom they have in themselves for that, for that moment. Um, so they sort of coach each other, perhaps. And as they go, then we find that Mary finds her voice. She sings this song about how God is changing the world, turning everything upside down, pulling the mighty down from their thrones and lifting up the lowly. We find Elizabeth um, also finding her voice. When John is born, she absolutely insists that his name will be John, despite the fact that everyone else wants it to be something else. And obviously Zechariah can't speak. It's only when he finally confirms her choice that... Um, that he gets to speak again. And the fact that she knew what John's name was supposed to be, which is something Gabriel had told Zechariah, suggests that perhaps, even though it doesn't tell us about this in the scripture, perhaps Gabriel visited her as well. Perhaps she was not surprised to find that this happened. She certainly knew what the baby's name was supposed to be, whether that was intuition or a messenger of some kind or I don't know how, but ultimately she is the one who names him, which is very unusual for the time. And then that's sort of the last moment that we hear really about Elizabeth. And it's when Jesus is born is one of the last moments we hear about Mary as well until he's 12 and then until he's on the cross. 
there's just not a lot going on about the parents. So for those of you who are parents, I invite you to remember what that's like to be preparing for a child to come and how much you might think, oh, I'm getting ready for this and this and this and every eventuality, but then once that baby is born, everything's on its head and nothing is exactly as you planned and we all realize there's a lot less control going on here than we thought. So that's what I'd like to invite us to think about in this week of Advent is how do we liturgically, as a community, so in the work of the people, how do we together be like Elizabeth and Mary? How do we support one another in preparing, in waiting, in anticipating, and also even when that's fearful anticipation sometimes or painful waiting or when it's joyful and excited, like how do we support one another so that we can be prepared for the coming of Christ who changes everything, who takes all of this out of our control anyway, but nonetheless, it's good to wait and be ready, as ready as we can. I don't know what ready looks like exactly, in this situation, nobody does, but the more we can support one another, the better off we will be. So that's what I hope we'll be doing this week of Advent, not just because it's the first of December, but because it's already the fifth day of Advent, like time is rushing on. So thinking about all those things, let's take a moment to pray together. Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this day that you have made. We give you thanks for the community that you place us in and for the privilege of working together as your people to see you, to recognize you, and to be prepared for whatever you would have us do. As we wait for your coming, we ask that you would prepare us, make us ready to receive whatever you have in store, even if we cannot control it. We ask in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. All right, friends, I hope you have a delightful rest of the first week of Advent, and I will see you again on Sunday and then again next week. Until then, cheers and peace be with you.